Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us tonight. We are studying our way through the book of Leviticus and tonight we are ready for Leviticus chapters 8, 9, and 10. So I hope you will be able to find a Bible and join us in Leviticus chapter 8. If you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if you have something we need to be praying about as a congregation, we invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we're in a brand new study of Leviticus. Last week we actually covered the first seven chapters. I don't know if we've ever covered seven chapters in one night before, but last night was that night, or last week rather, was the time to do that. And as I said, we plan on moving rather quickly through these books, and so I think we did get off to a good start in terms of uh, covering some territory. Uh, basically, we learned that Leviticus is a handbook or a manual for the priests, the Levites. They have this brand new tabernacle that they've just constructed, and they did that according to God's instructions there at the tail end of the book of Exodus, and now God has to tell them what to do with it. And the Levites are the ones responsible for this. So Le the book of Leviticus is their manual for doing that. In terms of a theme for the book, we talked about the importance of holiness, to be holy is to be separate or set apart. And Leviticus certainly explains both the importance of holiness as well as the how-to of holiness. Last week we noted Leviticus 20 verses 7 and 8 is something of a theme passage. That's where God says, You shall consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and practice them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And we noted that I think various forms of the word holy are found roughly 89 times. A throughout the book of Leviticus. We also learned last week that worship is dangerous, and that seems to be a major theme of Leviticus, and we'll definitely see that in tonight's passage. We noted that we sometimes talk about what to wear to worship, and we noted last week that crash helmets and flame-proof suits may be most appropriate to wear to worship. And part of that statement goes back to a passage that we hope to study in just a few moments. But even with the danger of worship, we also noted last week that Leviticus has been described as the gospel of the Old Testament. And the reason for that is because Leviticus contains the good news that we can approach God in worship, or at least they could, under the old law. And that was an amazing thing. God had given his people some instruction on doing this. So God is making himself available. And that is certainly very good news. By way of very brief review, Last week, we looked at the five major kinds of sacrifices under the Law of Moses. The first three were basically voluntary acts of worship, and the last two were mandatory. If you sinned under the old law, you had to offer one of these sacrifices, depending on the circumstances. In terms of a few highlights of this chart, we noted that each sacrifice had to be perfect. Uh, the animals could have no physical defects, and so you couldn't offer some animal with a disease or a broken leg. God expected the very best. But the other thing we noted is that God made allowances for the poor. And so if you couldn't afford a bull, God allowed a lesser sacrifice, like a goat or a bird or even a cup of flour. And, and he was good with that. If that's all you had, he wanted the best. But the sacrifice still had to be perfect. It couldn't be leftovers. It couldn't be some, you know, a, a diseased animal. Uh, and in all of this, we had, I think, just a kind of a preview of Jesus. We mentioned that last week. Uh, the application really isn't made in Leviticus, but Leviticus is a shadow of greater things to come. And we know today that Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. And this obviously is made abundantly clear in the book of Hebrews, and we just touched on that for a few moments. And so with this as background, now that the priest have some instruction concerning what to offer and how to make each offering, uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it tonight. And we'll start with an overview of Leviticus chapter 8. We won't read every verse in this chapter, but to kind of give us a taste for it, let's start with Leviticus 8 verses 1 through 5. Leviticus chapter 8 verses 1 through 5. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments and the anointing oil and the bull of the sin offering, and the two rams and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So Moses did just as the Lord commanded him. When the congregation was assembled at the doorway of the tent of meeting, Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded to do. 
So the Lord then tells Moses to consecrate the priest using the garments and the oil and the offering, the bull and the two rams and the unleavened bread, and to assemble the entire congregation at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And this is what Moses does. And he gets everybody together. And I love how Moses says, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded us to do. It's so simple, and this is pretty much the work of a gospel preacher today. He's not to be making up rules as he goes along, but the preacher's job is to simply present the information and then to encourage obedience to the gospel. So this is the thing which the Lord has commanded to do. And at this point in his life, Moses, notice he's very humble. It's not about Moses here. It's not because I said so or any of that. But this is all about what God has commanded. Moses is simply the messenger. Some time ago, I read a short statement using a restaurant as an illustration, explaining that the preacher is not the chef, but instead the preacher is the server, and his job is simply to get the food from the kitchen to the dining room without messing it up. And I appreciate that, and I think that's kind of what Moses is being called on to do here. God has told us to do this, and now let's do it. And that's what we see in the opening verses of chapter 8. And the rest of this chapter simply explains what they did. Uh, we won't read the rest of it here, but starting in verses 6 through 9, Moses washes Aaron and his sons with water. He has them put on the priestly garments. And if you're following along in a copy of the Bible on your own, in verses uh, uh, 10 through 13, he anoints them with the oil. In verses seven, or 14 through 17, he has them put their hands on the bull before offering the bull as a sacrifice and applying that blood to the altar. In verses 18 through 21, they do the same thing with the ram. In verses 22 through 30, they take the second ram, the ram of ordination, and then they sacrifice it and they apply the blood to Aaron and his sons, putting it on their right ear lobe, on the right thumb, on the big toe of the right foot. And they take the oil and the blood from the altar and they just sling it all over these men. And I don't know if we can imagine that. We don't do stuff like that in our worship assembly today. But I mean, to me, that sounds like something out of a horror movie, just uh, slaughtering these animals and sprinkling the blood here and there and putting it on your ear and your toe and your thumb. I mean, there would have to be blood absolutely all over the uh, tabernacle area. Uh, before we move on to the next chapter, I want us to look at the last paragraph in chapter 8. So skipping ahead to Leviticus 8, let's notice verses 31 through 36. Leviticus 8, 31 through 36. Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Boil the flesh at the doorway of the tent of meeting, and eat it there together with the bread which is in the basket of the ordination offering, just as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it. The remainder of the flesh and of the bread you shall burn in the fire. You shall not go outside the doorway of the tent of meeting for seven days, until the day that the period of your ordination is fulfilled, for he will ordain you through seven days. The Lord has commanded to do, as has been done this day, to make atonement on your behalf. At the doorway of the tent of meeting, moreover, you shall remain day and night for seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord, so that you will not die, for so I have been commanded. Thus Aaron and his sons did all the things which the Lord had commanded through Moses. Well, after the initial sacrifices, they are to boil the flesh, so they are to eat it then right there in the doorway of the tent of meeting, and they are to eat it along with the bread. And so as I see this, this is a huge fellowship dinner. This family gets together. This is their new service to the Lord. They are to then burn the rest in the fire, what they do not eat. And one thing I think I've missed on previous readings, at least in my life in the past, is that these men are to stay in the tabernacle for seven days. Did you catch that? And so they're away from their families, they're away from the congregation, they're separated. Remember, being holy, that's what that's about. So truly, they are separate now. And I'm thinking that these guys really get to know each other during this time. In my opinion, this is almost like our youth camp up north. You spend a week in the woods with people and you tend to learn things when you live together for a week. And it is a spiritual experience. So this is their ordination. These men are now holy. And they are now set apart to do the Lord's work. Before we move on, let's also notice how important this is. Notice according to verse 35, what's at stake here? What's going on? Moses tells them to do all of this exactly as God had instructed, so that you will not die, for so I have been commanded. So Moses then says that their obedience is literally a matter of life and death. 
And then down in verse 36, they obey. Aaron and his sons did all the things which the Lord had commanded through Moses. And one final note here before we move on. To the extent that Moses communicates accurately, Moses' words carry the same weight as God's commands. Moses is simply the messenger. And nothing is lost in translation here. When they obey Moses, they're actually obeying the Lord himself. Moses is God's spokesperson. So let's move into chapter 9. And let's take a look at Leviticus chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Leviticus 9, 1 through 7. Now it came about on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, take for yourself a calf, a bull for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, both without defect, and offer them before the Lord. Then to the sons of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a male goat for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both one year old without defect, for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for a peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord will appear to you. So they took what Moses had commanded to the front of the tent of meeting, and the whole congregation came near and stood before the Lord. Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Moses then said to Aaron, Come near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, that you may make atonement for yourself and for the people. Then make the offering for the people, that you may make atonement for them, just as the Lord has commanded. So now that Aaron and his sons have been ordained, it's time to get to work. And Moses guides them through it, kind of giving them step-by-step -step instructions for this first round of sacrifices. They hadn't really done this before. So they are to offer first for themselves so that they can then approach God in worship. And then they are to make sacrifice for the people. And according to verse 6, Moses says, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. And so if you do what God has commanded, he has promised to make an appearance here. And the rest of this chapter is basically Aaron and his sons following these instructions. So uh, Aaron and his sons work together on this. This is some on-the-job training. Um, as I understand it, they're all pretty much apprentices at this point under Moses. Moses has just learned about this from God himself. And now Moses is passing it on. He's bringing these men up to speed. So let's fast forward to the last paragraph of this chapter now that we've kind of summarized it. So we're picking up then with Leviticus 9 verses 22 through 24. Leviticus 9, 22 through 24. This is where we have the results of this first sacrifice. So Leviticus 9, 22 through 24. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he stepped down after making the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings, Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Then fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Well, in this last paragraph of chapter 9, they finish making this first major national sacrifice. Aaron blesses the people. Moses and Aaron go into the tent. They come out together. They bless the people. And notice when they do, the glory of the Lord appears to the people. So fire comes out from the presence of God and consumes those sacrifices. So the people see this. They shout. They fall down on their faces. And I wanted us to notice this right before we move into chapter 10, because I think this is very closely related to what comes next. If a leader of God's people stands before two to three million people and raises his hands and fire comes down and consumes a sacrifice. You know, there's a possibility that somebody might see that and get at least a little bit jealous. Do you remember Simon the sorcerer over in Acts chapter eight? Simon was a brand new convert to the Christian faith, having just been baptized. He's a former magician. And when he sees the ability to perform miracles is transmitted through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he wants that. He wants to be able to do that himself. And so he, he's asking for it, and he gets called on that, and he gets condemned. He's told to repent. It's not about the miraculous powers and all that. But the point is, doing amazing things in front of huge crowds of people 
is something that some people may want to be a part of. And there's a, this little flame, little spark of uh, uh, arrogance in a lot of people, probably in all of us, and you see something like that, and there's that little touch of, ooh, I wish that I could do something like that. So let's notice what comes next, because I think the context really, really matters here. So let's continue looking over into chapter 10, verses 1, 2, and 3. Leviticus 10, 1, 2, and 3. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. That right there is a terrifying passage. Remember, worship is dangerous. And again, let's remember the context. Aaron blesses the people. Fire comes down out of the presence of the Lord to ignite the sacrifice. It's very dramatic. And apparently, without any delay at all, at least according to what we have here, it just goes straight into this paragraph. Two of Aaron's four sons go grab their fire pans, and they went in on the action. You know, in my mind, hey, look at what Dad did. Let's see if we can do that, too. And we'll learn in the rest of this chapter that this very well might have been the original hold my beer moment. But we'll get back to that in just a moment. All we know at this point is that Nadab and Abihu offer incense to the Lord, but they offer it using strange fire or unauthorized fire. Some translations have it. But the point is they use a particular source of fire that God did not give them permission to use. And there's an interesting principle here. When God tells us what to do, and when he tells us very specifically what to do, he does not have to tell us every way that he does not want us to do it. I mean, that would be ridiculous. Our Bibles would be hundreds of times longer than they are right now if God had to explain every way that we are not to worship. And I know in the past we studied this a year or two ago in sermon form, but I've compared this principle to ordering a burger. If I head down to Culver's and order a burger with ketchup and mayo and cheddar, I do not need to specify that I do not want onion and mushrooms and Swiss and pickles and peanut butter or even a slice of orange on it. I don't have to specify all the things that I don't want. That's ridiculous. Because when I specify ketchup and mayo and cheddar, that right there is what I'm giving them permission to put on my burger. And I know it's a simple illustration. But perhaps in some similar way, over in Leviticus 16, 12, and 13, God specified where to get the fire for offering incense. This is what it says. He shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense, and bring it inside the veil. He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the ark of the testimony, otherwise he will die. So I hope we caught that. When offering incense, the priests were to get the fire from the altar before the Lord. That right there eliminates all other sources of fire. God didn't have to say where not to get fire. He told them where to get the fire. So that right there eliminated rubbing sticks together. It eliminated lighting a match. It eliminated using a Bic lighter, and on and on and on. But notice Nadab and Abihu, however, they apparently ignore God's very specific instructions, and they simply presume that God wouldn't mind. Well, surely God wouldn't mind. Haven't we heard that same argument today? Well, surely God wouldn't mind if we did this, this, or this. It is a dangerous thing to presume that God will be okay with one thing when he has specified something else. So also, if somebody puts anchovies on my hamburger at Culver's, we're about to have a problem, aren't we? Even though I never said, do not put anchovies on my burger. I hope that makes sense. This, by the way, is the reason why our worship is really, really simple at the Four Lakes Congregation. 
God has specified that we sing and pray and give and honor his word through the preaching of it and that we partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. And as a congregation, we simply do the best that we can to leave it at that. As we understand it, we don't have the Lord's permission to add a smoke machine to make worship more amazing or an orchestra or a band or to add fried chicken and mashed potatoes to the Lord's Supper, even though that might be a very tasty addition. Uh, but instead, we simply try our best to be mindful of this principle. Where God has specified, we limit ourselves to what he has specified. On the other hand, if God simply says, worship me, and leaves it at that, then we'd have some freedom. But as it is, God has specified what he wants, and our goal is simply to honor his holiness by, obedient, uh, by obeying it. Uh, Nadab and Abihu, though, they fail to honor God's holiness. They are immediately consumed by the fire that comes out from the presence of the Lord, and they die right there on the spot. We can hardly imagine that. And at this point, Moses has a one-line explanation to Aaron. Remember, Aaron has just lost two of his sons. Their bodies are still lying there, smoking in the doorway to the tabernacle. Aaron is there. Moses is there. Moses says, it is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. And that's it. And the text then says that Aaron, therefore, kept silent. He couldn't argue with that. He knows that his sons had offended the Lord. They were guilty. Yes, they had disobeyed. There's no defense. They, they had ignored the Lord's instruction, and they had paid for it with their lives. Well, let's take a look at what happens next. Let's pick up with verses 4 through 7. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 4 through 7. Moses called also to Mishael and Elisphan, the sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, Come forward, carry your relatives away from the front of the sanctuary to the outside of the camp. So they came forward and carried them still in their tunics to the outside of the camp, as Moses had said. Then Moses said to Aaron and to his sons Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not uncover your heads nor tear your clothes so that you will not die, and that he will not become wrathful against all the congregation. But your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, shall bewail the burning which the Lord has brought about. You shall not even go out from the doorway of the tent of meeting, or you will die. For the Lord's anointing oil is upon you. So they did according to the word of Moses. Well, we're not going to go through this word by word, but basically Aaron and his family are forbidden from mourning over the loss of Aaron's own sons. Moses then calls some other relatives in and has them drag the bodies outside the camp, still wearing the tunics, and they are to be left there. And the rest are forbidden from showing any outward signs of mourning for these men, but instead, uh, the nation is to mourn. So Aaron and his other sons just have to stand there. Uh, they're, kind of, they're kind of stuck in the tabernacle. They can't mourn. The rest of the nation has to mourn. Um, they're still covered in the anointing oil, so they can't leave. That means they are holy. And so they have to stay on duty, so to speak, or they're going to die. They've got a job to do. Um, and we close this paragraph by noting that they obey. As hard as that would have been to do, they do according to the word of Moses. And we now come to a really strange warning, unless it is tied to the context, which I believe that it is. Um, so let's continue then with Leviticus chapter 10, verses 8 through 11. Leviticus 10, 8 through 11. The Lord then spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you, when you come into the tent of meeting, so that you will not die. It is a perpetual statute throughout your generations. And so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, and between the unclean and the clean, and so as to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. Isn't that strange? That warning makes no sense whatsoever, in my mind at least, unless wine or strong drink had played a role in this incident. And so Aaron's sons, in context, see their dad do this amazing thing, and they apparently want in on that action. And so they launch off, they do it on their own, by themselves, while ignoring the Lord's instructions. They are struck dead on the spot, and God basically responds by saying, don't drink when you are on duty as a priest. 
and I don't know about to you, but to me, those two really seem to have to be connected. And the reason for the no drinking on priest duty rule is to make sure that the priests make a distinction between the holy and the profane, between the unclean and the clean, and to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes which the Lord had spoken to them through Moses. You can't do that under the influence, God is saying. And as we said last week and again tonight, worship is truly a matter of life and death. You know, I find it interesting that the priests were not forbidden from drinking wine when they were out there in the community. That's not what we're talking about in this passage, in this context. But when they're serving in the tent of meeting, those men had better blow a 0.0, .0 as we would say today. I think we might compare it to a commercial airline pilot today. And that right there is serious duty. We don't want pilots drinking on the job. And when they do, when they're discovered, it makes the news because it's such a huge deal. And so in a similar way, God's priests are not to be under the influence when they are serving in the temple. And I know we could study for weeks on this. There's so much more about that that we could say from other passages in the Word of God. We're trying to limit this uh, to the book of Leviticus. Uh, but this is the warning here from the Lord through Moses in the context that, in which we find it. Well, let's continue with the next section, but we'll skip a few verses that give some of the details of the sacrifice. So let's just look at Leviticus 10, 12, and 13, and then we'll just skip down to verses 16 through 20 where we have it kind of applied. So Leviticus 10, starting in verse 12. Then Moses spoke to Aaron and to his surviving sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, Take the grain offering that is left over from the Lord's offerings by fire and eat it unleavened beside the altar, for it is most holy. You shall eat it, moreover, in a holy place, because it is your due and your son's due out of the Lord's offerings by fire, for thus I have been commanded. And then skipping down to verse 16, But Moses searched carefully for the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it had been burned up. And so he was angry with Aaron's surviving sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, saying, Why did you not eat the sin offering at the holy place? For it is most holy, and he gave it to you to bear away the guilt of the congregation, to make atonement for them before the Lord. Behold, since its blood had not been brought inside into the sanctuary, you should certainly have eaten it in the sanctuary, just as I commanded. But Aaron spoke to Moses, Behold, this very day they presented their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. When things like these happened to me, if I had eaten a sin offering today, would it have been good in the sight of the Lord? When Moses heard that, it seemed good in his sight. I don't remember the context, but within the past few weeks, I remember watching a brief video of soldiers uh, manning machine guns, practicing what happens when the guy in the gun gets hit. And so the guy firing the gun would kind of pretend to get hit and just go limp. And, and the new guy would come in and roll the body out of the way and then get the gun back in action and keep on firing. I don't know if you've seen something like that or experienced that in your own life and training. Uh, but that's what I see here. Nadab and Abihu get taken out by the Lord. And Moses immediately has the next two brothers step in. Now imagine being in that situation. Your two brothers have worshipped incorrectly. They've been burned alive in front of several million people, and now it's your turn. I want you two guys to come in here and pick up where they left off. In this case, Moses reviews the law. He continues in those verses that we skipped over. And if I've understood this correctly, he tells them to make a sacrifice, but to save some of it for themselves, to eat with their families. Remember, this is how God planned on the priest making a living. This is their job. So yes, you're doing holy work and you're offering part of the animal to the Lord, but you can eat the other half because that's how you're going to eat going forward. This, this is the work that you're doing. You deserve this, he's saying. However, in verse 16, when Moses comes back, kind of as a manager, you know, supervisor looking over the situation here after the previous incident, you know, I'm thinking the sign like zero days since a lost time incident, you know, Moses comes back, he's kind of looking over how things are going. He's horrified to discover that the goat of the sin offering had been completely burned up. And so instead of saving some of it to eat, the next two brothers had burned all of it. And Moses sees that and he's hot, he's angry. So he calls these two brothers in and Moses just tears into them. And, you know, after the last incident, you would think these guys would follow some instructions, but they've blown it. And Moses is incredibly upset here. 
However, notice at the end, Aaron steps in and he explains, when things like these happened to me, if I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been good in the sight of the Lord? And we don't have much of an explanation here, but uh, you know, there's some things I wish I knew about this whole situation. But my understanding is that these men are completely torn up over this. And to them, it just didn't seem right to eat the sacrifice after what had just happened to their brothers. And to me, I'm, I'm thinking about being upset over something today, maybe to the point where I'm almost too upset to worship. Have you ever been in that situation? They're, they're, you just can't focus, you're, they're, you're mad or you're upset or some grief and I just can't sing the songs. I, I can't pray, I'm not, I'm not a, I can't do it. And, and I think that's what's going on here. And when Moses hears this explanation from dad, from Aaron, the, the father of these two remaining priests, Moses hears this and he accepts it and they, and they move on. So it's a strange passage, isn't it? You know, now I've heard people mock the idea of precision obedience, you know, so they come in, oh, what are you talking about? You got to obey God directly. That's such a stupid idea. And, and I've heard this passage used in that context because we've got God killing two men but sparing the next two men, even though all four brothers had technically disregarded the Lord's instructions here. Do you kind of see the problem? The first two get burned to a crisp instantly for not doing the thing. And the next two, ah, okay, you'll be all right. So there's kind of a different thing going on there. However, do we see a difference between these two scenarios? And I would love to hear your thoughts on this. This is like one time I really wish we could be together in a room. You know, on the other hand, or on one hand, Nadab and Abihu, perhaps under the influence, they have no regard for what's holy. So that, that's the first incident. But then on the other hand, we've got Eleazar and Ithamar, who are practically, they've practically gone to the other extreme, haven't they? You know, they see God as so holy and they are not, that they feel completely unworthy to partake of the sacrifice. That's their reasoning. So they didn't go into this under the influence and slinging stuff around, not paying attention. They were paying such careful attention. Uh, they were so upset, so scared maybe? I don't know if that's the proper word. They had so much respect for God that they just couldn't. They couldn't eat that sacrifice even though it was due them. So they deserved it technically under the law, but they just, they didn't, they couldn't, they didn't feel worthy of consuming it. So again, let me know if you have any thoughts on this. this. This is my take on it. But this brings us to the end of our second lesson from the book of Leviticus. We studied the first 10 chapters now. So 10 chapters in two weeks. We are booking it. Uh, next week, let's start looking at the rules concerning what it means to be clean before the Lord. We'll see this in Leviticus chapters 11 through 16. And I don't know if we'll cover all of that next week. I haven't prepared that class yet, but I hope you can join us as we study the concept of being clean before the Lord uh, next Wednesday at seven o'clock, Leviticus chapters 11 through 16. If not the whole chunk, we'll at least probably cover half of it, hopefully all of it. Uh, but as always, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I know it's a sacrifice of your time, but there's a value to it. If there's something we need to be praying about, if there's some way we can help or encourage you, we want you to reach out send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are a holy and all-powerful God, and we realize tonight that worship truly is dangerous. We're thankful, though, that we can still approach you through Jesus. We understand from Scripture that Jesus took on the punishment that we deserve, and so we praise you for his sacrifice. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for being with us. And thank you, Father, for not restricting your presence to a single tent. We love you, Father, and we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.